Hey there, I'm Ryan and welcome to today's acrylic landscape lesson. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description. And if you'd like help with the drawing process, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon. If you're interested, check it out. But with that, let's jump in and have some fun. We're going to begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush and dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water, then wipe the excess off. This will help us extend the wet life of our paint. From there, we'll head to our palette and grab some quinacridone magenta, move that to a clean spot. We'll grab about an equal mixture in our primary yellow. This should render a nice, rich, fairly red, but saturated orange. Then we'll desaturate it a little bit and thicken it with some titanium white. And we'll desaturate it slightly more with a hint of Mars black. You can see I'm taking off the excess because it's just such a strong, prominent pigment. And from there, we'll head into the canvas. I'll begin by taking this and lining my horizon with a an abundance of horizontal strokes, as you can see. We'll work slightly to dodge the clouds, but if I overlap them, that's okay. We can always just redraw them in. And as you can tell, the pigments right here, the quinacridone magenta, the yellow, aren't that thick. So you can kind of see the canvas through the first layer. It means we will have to do multiple layers, but that's actually a good thing because gives us time to perfect our colors and our applications. With that, as you move up, we're going to make it more of a yellow dominant orange, and we'll brighten it slightly with some additional titanium white. Just like that, get a good consistent mix so areas aren't somewhat more red, somewhat more yellow. We want something that is consistent all the way across. I'm applying this on top of my clouds and I love using this one inch flat headed brush for things like this because it has a nice sharp edge which allows me to cut around a lot of my subjects but it also just carries so much paint. You can see that we're making it all the way from the left to the right. I'm going to unify a lot of their strokes by just softly working over them in a horizontal pattern and I'll even grab a little bit of it, head down, and mix it into that first much more red application that we had. In the slight areas that blend, we will do the blend like that. And again, we soften it. Now, yet again, we need to continue moving upwards. So we grab some extra titanium white, extra primary yellow, and maybe a hint of that quinacridone magenta. We'll continue working our way up. The more titanium white we use, the thicker these applications will become, because unlike the primary yellow and the quinacridone, it just has a much more thick body. And we continue to blend all of this downwards even in here. Now, initially, you were probably looking at this and you were saying, huh, it's, it's probably a little bit too red. And you were right, it was. But we made it more red because we knew that we were going to incorporate all of this orange into the blend and that it would slowly blend and turn into the color that we really wanted it to. So there was a little bit of foresight that we had to have there, but starting to work out quite nicely. Next, yet again, we add titanium white, we add our yellow, we have a warm yellow mixture, and this will be great for right where our sun is, and that'll be to the right of the center. So I'll start by just blocking in an area. You can see that we're slowly losing what we had in regards to the clouds, but that's okay. We can, again, always just redraw those on. And then very softly with my brush, I'm blending this into our previous applications. It's imperative that it is soft, because the harder you press, the more brush strokes you'll render. 
and we're trying to avoid those for the most part. You can see that it dissipates over to the left hand side and it is going to look a little bit messy for the next couple of minutes, but that's okay. That is acrylic painting. Often it's a great deal of layering and just building up that foundation. So do have faith in yourself, trust the process, and we will get there. You've seen the thumbnail. I think I probably put a preview of what it turns into at the end. So, again, don't get discouraged if yours doesn't look amazing in this step. It's not meant to, and that's A-OK. -okay. Here, just going back, getting more of those soft blends. And we need to build this up over time, but when it's really wet, it's difficult to apply more paint because you almost end up ripping some off with any level of pressure. So I want to let it dry a little bit more before we continue applying to that area. So while we give that a bit of a rest, we're going to continue moving upwards and we're going to do so with a bit more of a pinkish orange. So in the same way we were grabbing from that initial orange to create the yellow, we're grabbing from it to create a bit more of a pink variant that I want to be brighter than what we previously had and I'm leaving some of it here just so we can match and just ensure that we are moving in the right direction. Kind of compare. I'm going to grab a hint of Mars Black. You have to be very careful with this because Mars Black and the primary yellow will make more of a green. So we do need more of a red in our mixture so that it doesn't become a green but we want the black and the white to desaturate this further, make it more gray. And here you can see the difference between the initial orange and what I'm working towards. Now, I'm going to apply this above, leaving a little bit of distance for the most part in between the two pigments, very intentionally so that we don't take orange from that and drag it over here while we want this new clean pigment. And I can just work this around this more complex cloud that we have here. Again, maybe we end up covering it up, maybe we don't, but we have a good general idea of where it is still. I'm going to grab slightly more water, slightly more of this pigment, and we're probably going to be doing a wet into dry blend, meaning that the orange is fully dry but the pigment we have on our brush is wet and to do that you essentially go in with a bit of a damp brush and you essentially let the pigment work its way down over the previous application and slowly dissipate so that you get a clean gradient from the new pigment to the old pigment and there isn't an actual blend going on but there's a visual blend because it's becoming less and less of this and more and more of what's underneath. That said, I think it could be a little bit more red. We'll work that in. Just like that. Don't forget about the sides, the other areas we applied it. And then, if you'd like, you can even go back to more of the original orange and do a wet into wet blend. And both work. It's really a preference thing. Here you can see I'm working a real abundance of paint and that's something I like to do when I work on large skies because often you have to do a lot of blending quickly. And here you can see I'm just remixing to that initial orange or at least something similar to it. Something quite similar. It's a bit more saturated bit more yellow heavy and that looks pretty great. Now I'll take off the excess from my brush and in the process here we may go over our yellow sun but we did need to go over that again anyway so it's okay. This is why I preface that the painting is going to look a little rough <laughs> for uh, just a minute but that it isn't really a concern or an issue because it is this process that will get us to what we really want. And we need to do multiple layers anyway because acrylics are semi-transparent. So, 
We're just slowly working our way, building those layers. There we go. Grab more of that yellow titanium white mixture. A little bit of orange. Re-interject that in here. Take off the excess. Do that blend. Work in a bit of an X-shaped pattern to move it not only horizontally but vertically as well. There we are. Now we'll start working upwards and for this we're going to get a bit more of a gray mixture. So I'll grab some titanium white, Mars black, mix up a brighter gray and if we have hints of yellow or our magenta in there that's okay because we are going to add a little bit of magenta anyway. And we'll add about a third of that in our yellow. We don't want much yellow because we do have quite a bit of Mars black in this mixture and we do need the red to be more prominent. Then I'm going to start applying this here and to be honest with you that's probably a little bit too dark so we'll double up on our titanium white, go back over it and we'll start working our way down. It's not a pure gray, it does still have those other colors, but now we need to do a bit of a wet and a wet, so I'm going to remix this color, which was, again, very magenta heavy, but still had a little bit of our yellow and a little bit of our Mars black, quite a bit of titanium white. There we go. Just apply that on top. We can see it's a lot of going back and forth. With different colors. Just like this. Getting those blends right. You can see slowly working that warmth up into the gray and the gray down into the rest being fairly soft with my brush strokes so that I don't get a bunch of streaks really working it back and forth though and then as we get higher we actually want to start incorporating some of our blue so I'll grab that ultramarine blue Hint of our magenta, place that on top, do a little bit of a blend down, grab more, other side, blend down, we're going to get higher, for that we're going to get darker, more Mars black and more blue. And I'll avoid the cloud in the top center. But again, a bit of an X-shaped pattern to bring the darker pigments down and the lighter pigments up. Then a horizontal stroke to balance it. It definitely needs another layer or two, but that's okay. go. And remember if your brush is damp this will be a whole lot easier because it'll keep that paint wet longer and it'll help us with blends from that into that. Now for a very important lesson, just because the canvas is covered doesn't mean that it's necessarily done. At least not to the extent that you may want it to be. With acrylics, we do have to do a lot of layering, but it also gives us an opportunity to change things that we might want to. For instance, here, for me, this is a little bit brighter than I want, and we're going to go back to that with a combination of this and this. I will mix it in the middle, 
make it nice and easy. At this point, both of these have fully dried, so I will be working with a wet into dry blend, unless, of course, we remix the other colors. And I'll just start by applying an orange, which is fairly similar to what we have down here. Again, making my brush damp right now. Get that wet into dry. Worked out really nicely. Now we need to continue working it up. And we'll make it a bit more white, maybe a little bit more pink. Just like so. We don't want to do a lot of blending down if this is still wet at all because then we'll be dragging blues down into delicate yellow areas. But because it's dry, I can do a little bit more. There we go. Now, yet again, more titanium white, maybe a little bit more pink. Maybe a hint of Mars black. See that? It's one of those things where it's not necessarily definitively better, but it's different. And it's all about making it how you want it to be, right? Well, this is a, a tutorial, a lesson. It's meant to teach you how to paint, not necessarily how to paint exactly what I'm painting. Because you may have your own preferences, and you may want to turn it into something a little bit different, and that's entirely okay. I just wanted to show you here that it's okay to go back and rework on these things. I think a lot of people when they start painting they're afraid of messing up what they've worked so hard to create, but realistically, you made that once, you can do it again, and you can probably do it again even better, because you learned what you did it the first time. So don't be afraid to go back, don't be afraid to work on it. try to have fun with the process. Just a little bit more to do right here up at the top corners. And I still do want that to be a bit more blue, a bit more black, a bit more titanium white, but I'm actually going to blend it with this create a bit of a better transitionary color. Painting with a lot of paint on my brush, which again is something that makes painting larger skies easier. But if you get the color wrong, <laughs> it's a lot to course correct with, which is why I don't normally do it and I, I kind of just do it with, with skies. Um, but it definitely does make this portion easier. And again, if you, if you don't get the perfect color, it's okay. You're going to do more than one layer. But we'll just finish this up. So we can get on to some fun detail work. Now for the smaller clouds, we're going to switch to our Filbert brush. This one is about one third of an inch and it's great because it has a sharp uh, body so you can render real details, but it has rounded edges so you can get good blends if you want to. It's a very versatile brush. With that, we're going to start by rendering a fairly dark gray. So a little bit of titanium white, about an equal mixture of Mars black, but Mars black is a much stronger pigment, so it will be darker rather than a uh, medium gray. And then we need to add hue. So we'll do so with little bit of our ultramarine, equal amount of our magenta, and that right there is a nice thick, fairly desaturated purple, which will be great for these clouds. Now I'm going to take my pinky finger to eliminate shake from my hand, and I'm going to come in and start drawing on all of these distant clouds. Initially, I noted them as 
small, but they aren't actually small. They're just far away, so they look small. But they are fairly opaque, so light isn't really working its way through them. It will around the edges a little bit, but we'll instigate that application a little bit later. Once we have the majority of them worked in, and I'll get you a little bit closer for this plug process. So here we are, quite a bit closer. When I work on clouds like this, I like to begin along the edges because when you have fresh paint on your brush, when it's recently been wet, which this one has, you have the best ability to render very intentional, sharp detail. And as that pigment starts to dissipate on the brush, as the water in the brush runs out, that becomes more and more difficult. So, while it's easier, I like to get the edges, and then when I start to run out, then I'll apply more pressure with my brush in the center of the cloud, get the remainder of the paint off of it, and I know it looks like I have a lot of paint still left on my brush, but it wasn't really on the direct tip, and so I didn't have the ability to render detail like I did at the top. With that, I'm going to grab a little bit of water, wipe off the excess, go back to the palette, grab some paint, and now, again, that I have fresh paint and water, you can see that I'm not filling in the center anymore. I'm working the edges. And now it's getting more and more difficult, so I will go back into the center, and you can see that I can't even fill that out. I don't have enough paint. So, grab a bit more. Don't really have any more edges in this area, so rather than doing an edge, I'll fill in what we have. There we go. And then we'll start working our way on over to the right. Now, at this point, these clouds look very two-dimensional. They don't look three-dimensional yet, right? We don't have light wrapping around them, moving through them, but we need to build out this initial, essentially, silhouette to get to a point where we can work on the more delicate integrations of light. So, we just build our base. You can see here, it's not really a thick application. I don't have enough actual paint on my brush. Instead, it was predominantly water. So I'll remix more paint right on top of my previous mixture, but leaving some off to the side so that I can use that as a reference to make sure that my new mix correlates with the older mix effectively. That looks quite good. The more times you have to mix it, the better at mixing you'll get. So while with the sky, we mixed a grand amount of paint for those, here I'm mixing very minimal amounts because it's just good practice to remix your paints. Makes finding them in the future a lot easier because you can't really get lucky, land on the right color, and then just use that initial mixture to do everything you need to. You're forcing yourself to refine that pigment, so you have to understand how you got there. And do a little bit of memorization, right? Again, good for actually learning for the future. There we go. Now, I'm doing a whole lot more than just that. We're going to continue with that same mixture work upwards because we don't just have the singular line of clouds, right? We have a lot of negative space up above them and really the only subject that we have to implement is clouds. Luckily, the reference photo is abundant with them, so I have a good idea of where everything is going to be, but of course, as per usual, you can find the reference photo in the video description. You can also find it up over on Patreon where you can also get access to the traceable where all of these 
are drawn out. So if you are using tracing paper for the drawing process or a miniature projector, or you just want to use a, a grid, you can copy it all exactly. And we do that for all of these hour plus long lessons. So if you love to paint, but you kind of struggle with that drawing process, that is an option. And again, it's just up over on Patreon, linked in the video description. It's also just a, a great way to support the channel if you find that you are doing a lot of these lessons and enjoying the process. And I always really appreciate it. There we go. You can see that all of these clouds are different shapes, sizes, and that is imperative. We want that element of randomization. They all look like they're the same type of subject. They all look like they're clouds, but they all also look different from one another. And that adds a lot of realism over time. Now, as we move up, we get to larger ones. And these are going to change dramatically, but like the bottom, we need a base layer. Now this base layer, as you can see, is very watery. It's not opaque at all. You can see the colors from the sky showing through, which looks a little sloppy, to be honest. And a great indicator that we need more paint. It's very easily fixable, right? But what I'm doing right now is I'm essentially very lightly with paint, watery paint, and not an abundance of paint, sketching on these clouds and where I want them to be. It's not meant to be a finalized rendition. I just want to get a feel for the general movements of the cloud, the shapes that are within it, because it's large. It takes up a big part of this painting. And I just want to ensure that we have a, a good understanding of it before we commit heavily to a lot of thick paint, right? Because it's a lot easier to cover this up than it is something like this. So when you're unsure about a subject, sizing, space, detail levels, do it a little bit more thinly. Here you can see, it. you can even hear maybe. I'm just scratching the pigment on and not really going for something too professional at this point, just trying to get a general understanding. It's also worth noting that this isn't like a great technique to use for your brushes, long-term health, but I am using the new uh, prototypes for my brush line that's going to be coming out later this summer and I'm putting them to the test. And what's great is I'm not seeing any loose hair or strands. That's always really annoying when you buy a brush set and then you get little bristles out everywhere. So happy to see that going really well. Uh, though I like the general shapes and I think I'm ready to commit to some more. So let's get a little bit closer, fill them in. So here we are a bit closer, remixed an abundance of paint. And because I just mixed that paint, I'm actually going to work in the middle of the cloud, different from what we were doing down here, breaking that rule, but only because I still have a lot of paint left on my brush and it was too much paint to paint with detail. So I'm just making use of what was left in the larger mix. And I'm quite happy with that. So now we'll grab some water, clean off the brush, but keep it damp, grab some extra pigment, head back towards those edges and create some much better finite markings. I'll also redefine some of the shapes within this cloud just to better reflect that of the reference photo, but also take artistic liberties to have fun with it, make it my own. Sometimes we innately like certain patterns, and even when you're following a reference photo, it's okay to deviate. Reference photos are great because they ensure that you are 
images don't end up looking cartoony due to a lack of greater understanding of the subject. Uh, a lot of us, when we go to draw or paint subjects initially, they end up looking a little cartoony because we have this idea in our head of what they look like. And often that idea comes from what we learn when we're young. So when we're watching cartoons or something like that, we get an idea of, oh, well, you know, trees are always brown and green. But in reality, they have a lot of different grays and other unique pigments in there. Different browns, different earthy tones, yellows. The, the, the point is that we have these simplified ideas of what subjects are. And reference photos help us see a lot more detail than what we would initially think of. But we don't have to be handcuffed by the reference photo to do exactly what it tells us to. It's there to be an aid, to help us, not to kind of rob us of our own creativity. Really like the general shapes that we're landing on here. Something I always try to do when I create clouds is not try to create these overly complicated subjects, but try to create lots of little shapes that amalgamate together to render something much larger. So here it's a little circle and then maybe there's a rectangle and then there'll be another circle and then maybe there'll be a, like a triangle that comes out of it. But once you start looking at subjects as shapes, basic shapes, rather than, oh, it's a cloud, recreating them becomes a whole lot easier. There we go. Trying not to be too repetitive with my patterns. Just like that. Again, very two-dimensional. We will build them out. Now we're going to do one more little cloud with this and then we'll have some fun but we will come back to adding more clouds. Here we still have a lot of negative space, different kinds of clouds. We just need a different palette than what we're currently working with. So I'm going to finish up with that and now we're going to go in and make it a bit more interesting, a bit more three-dimensional. So I'll grab some of my magenta, titanium white, and now that it doesn't have too much Mars black in it, we can incorporate a little bit of our primary yellow, start working towards a bit of a desaturated but darker orange, something that looks a little bit more earthy, like that. Just gonna do a little test on my reference photo. It's good, but I think it could be slightly more of a red and slightly brighter, not too much though. There we go. Just gonna do another little test. Ooh, I like that. Okay, great. So, we need to think about where the light is and everything that essentially has an edge that is touching that light, has an opportunity for this highlight. So, for instance, the back of this cloud right here has a lot of opportunity for the sun to hit it and work that light around it. So I'm going to start on the edges and I'm going to overlap the edges just a little bit because the worst thing that can happen is you have that dark edge and then you have this highlight. So, do feel free to overlap onto your sky. I'm essentially working on the right hand sides that face the light. And then I'm doing a little bit of a blend in towards the cloud. And I'm doing that through a very soft application. I'm using the edge of the brush, which is rounded, so I get a bit of a gradient. This is all dry, so I'm doing a wet into dry blend. So it isn't the most clean, perfect blend in the world, but it doesn't have to be. And then I'm going to go back and do some additional applications 
Why more than one? Because when you apply acrylics, typically, because they're semi-transparent, you see the original pigment showing through and the original pigment is darker. So we don't actually, we're not rendering the same color on here that we have on the palette. If you look at this and you look at that, they're different. And that's because you can still see the darker pigment underneath. So we need to build it up layer after layer. That's best done by letting it dry. So we will do that. We'll take this opportunity to go and work on this cloud. The bottom, obviously, getting a lot of light. But the areas to the right might also get a little bit. This protrudes. This is essentially the bottom of this shape. And it's on the right. So we'll do some there. I do a little taps, splotches here and there. Just a little bit of a highlight around the edge because it is being backlit. There we go. Very subtle, right? To begin with, which is good. It essentially lets you test. And then I'll apply some over here. There we go. Do a soft blend. Using that edge. Nice and easy. And that, I think, is essentially showing the promise of everything else. So let's remix, but this time we get a little bit brighter. We still need our ultramarine blue and our Mars black, but we can use more titanium white. We can use more of our red. We can use more of our yellow. There you can see it's a bit more of a green just a little bit. It's earthy, but definitely is more green in there. So we'll punch up the red. Then we'll add more yellow. So now you can see it's more of a, a warm pigment, more of an orange than it is a green. And again, we need to brighten it. So titanium white, just like that. And there's the comparison between the two. Always try to keep the old pigments on the palette so that you can compare them. Oh, that is nice. That is really nice. Now, the previous applications have dried, so this is going on well, but it does mean, yet again, we're going in with that wet into dry application. There we go. Just building those layers. Nice and easy. A soft blend. Very little pressure with that brush. As we discussed. Maybe a little bit around the edges for that backlighting. And this isn't the final layer. You can always go back and touch it up, but you can see the light working its way underneath these and building. There we go. On the right hand side, we will have the highlights on the left of the clouds, counterintuitive. There we are. It's all working out. Just takes a little bit of patience, but a very cathartic experience, certainly. love when you get to that point in the painting where you just kind of sink into it, you feel like you're there. Wonderful. That said, again, let's get you a little bit closer. 
Now, with these ones right here, we're not going to get as much detail as what we have up in the top area because they are just farther away. We're not going to be able to see it. So we're switching to a small liner brush. This one is fantastic for detail work, incredibly sharp tip, great for just working around our edges. So we'll make sure that's nice and damp. Grab some of the pigment we've been working in. With these, we're not so much working to the left or right of them, but rather almost all the way around. They are very backlit. So I'm essentially tracing the edges, but I'm also doing slight blends inward. Also, much like our previous applications, I'm going slightly outside of the initial markings that way we don't have an awkward dark edge showing through at any point. It's much better to expand these a little bit than it is to accidentally have that darker edge because it just doesn't make sense and it breaks the illusion of reality for it. This can dissipate as you move farther and farther away from the actual light. Here you can see I'm blending it in, just moving it downwards, letting it dissipate. And this is something that we can go back and do numerous times as we build up our layers, make them more thick. You can even create nice little additional new edges, should we want to, elaborate on the initial design. There we go. One of those things where the more you do it, the better it looks. The more cohesive it feels. Again, applying a lot in that center area, letting it Dissipate now as I move towards the left hand side, but we will do a wet and a dry blend. Just working that in, soft brush strokes, not much pressure, not much paint left, not much water left. Very subtle. Now I wanted to back up the camera because often when we work on detail like this, we can really dive deep. And as a result, we make these areas hyper detailed and perhaps more so than we should. Remember, it's a distant subject. We're not going to see too, too much of it, at least its intricacies. And if we add too many, then we kind of take away from what's interesting with our foreground. So, it's important to take those steps back, look at the painting from a distance. Something else you can do is hold your brush like this. Technically, it's more correct. It takes away a lot of your initial precision, but it gives you an element of almost a random stroke to a point where it makes your applications be a bit more natural. It also allows you to paint from a bit more of a distance. So it's something I'm going to incorporate here. And while I say that it's technically more correct if you go to art school, it's likely how they'll teach you uh, because of the benefits listed. However, I am a firm believer that you should create however you are most comfortable creating, however you like to create. So, sometimes I hold my brush like a pencil, sometimes I hold my brush like a brush, and I recommend that you do whichever you prefer, but I do think you should, in the very least, try doing both, because I personally find that it's something that I like to work back and forth between, and having both abilities is just great for your general artistic tool set, right? So, something to consider. I'm also going to take this and I'll work it towards the bottom of this cloud, move it up the right hand side, 
because the light is again going to get a little bit of the bottom, it's going to definitely get the right. There we go. Doing a bit of a softer blend out. Like that. Maybe do a little bit around the back because that light will wrap around to a point. And I'm also just going to embellish these more wispy clouds that we have here. Maybe add some extra tails to them. In the current pigment, it'll look a lot softer. It'll make those areas less opaque and just add some general diversity to the painting. So, lots of options. But again, this is something I would recommend doing from a little bit of a distance if you can, because it'll be easier to discern how much of this you should be applying if you're far away, because you'll be able to get a look at the whole canvas and see it all in context. I'll also drop in some extra smaller clouds as well as pieces to the ones that we've pre-established once we have the majority of those edges worked in. And I can do this because I can gauge how much detail we have and how much room we can play with additional detail, right? It's only until we do the necessity that we can kind of work in the spectrum of addition. There we go. Again, I think I can do a little bit more right around here. Creating these extra clouds has the potential to give us significantly more realism. In fact, we're going to do a much larger one, which I can see in the reference photo in just a second. So there's essentially a large cloud or a series of clouds that create a cluster and they move from here, semi in the midground, into the background. How we're going to do this, we'll grab quite a bit. I'm not sure if you can hear the train outside, but I always love trains. When I was a kid, my parents took me to this place with old decommissioned trains. My best friend came with me. And it was just one of those great road trip days. One of those memories that never really leaves you. And it, it definitely created a, an appreciation for trains and that sort of travel. Also now living in Toronto, it's uh, <laughs> very useful. So, I don't know. I hope you also have those positive connotations attached to it when you hear them in these videos and elsewhere, if you can hear it. But anyways, here, again, clusters of clouds stretching into the distance. You can see I'm working with horizontal lines for the most part, going all the way back. We create openings in between. We paint it from a distance. I think that looks pretty great. With that, we are going to brighten the sun. We're going to continue working on the clouds, but I want to get us closer before we do so. Before we add the snow, <laughs> the snow, before we add, Canadian, sorry, uh, <laughs> the highlights and the sun right there, I do want to add additional highlights to the clouds themselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the filbert brush just because it's easier to mix paint with than the liner. Liner is great for detail, but it doesn't really pick up, move around, mix paint well. So we want something with just a larger surface area. So using the one inch flathead is great. Using this is great. 
but I, I didn't feel like we needed a massive abundance of it. So that's why we're going in right now with the filbert rather than the one inch flat and over the liner. With that, here you can see I'm just going ahead and remixing the pigment that we already had, but I'm going to make a brighter variant of it and one that's slightly more orange. So, more yellow, more red, and more titanium white, but we also have the Mars black in there because I do want to keep it fairly desaturated. And as you can see, both the magenta and the primary yellow are quite saturated. So we're just trying to find that balance. I think that right there is very close. Just add some extra titanium white to it. That'll be great for our mix. Take off the, the majority, clean our brush so that we don't have all of that mixed pigment drying along the edges. Something else I'd like to note, I try not to get the pigment down towards the bottom of the bristle as it happens sometimes, but it's definitely harder to clean on just about all of your brushes. So do try to keep the paint towards the top. With that, back to the liner and back to these. We let them dry which is great, makes it easier to apply this pigment. And we add a detail to these clouds so we can add a bit more up here should we want to. And I do want to. I'm also applying those highlights to a greater degree but working off of the ones that we've pre-established. So it's going to give us additional volume You can see just how much more natural these little pieces and highlights make the clouds feel. We can also get additional levels of intended detail using the liner brush, then the filbert. It's also useful in these scenarios. Again, highlighting the edges that are facing the light as well as some of the bottoms. Just building that out. Might add some of that highlight to other areas very close to the light. further creating depth within our subjects. Not overusing it though. There we go. And then remember we're working with acrylics so if you like it you go back and you do another layer and you build it up because the pigment is not the same as what we have on the palette. It's a combination of the palette and what's already on the canvas. There we go. Starting to look quite nice. But it does require some patience. Now I'm going to be careful, but one more time I'm going to brighten this color. So titanium white and then saturating it with the red and the yellow. I did my mix, as you could see, with the liner brush because I didn't need much paint at all. This is just for the areas we really want to pop here in the midground. Lots of tapping to blend. 
This is great for our edges and the wispy areas that find their way moving out of the larger bodies of clouds. Holding the brush farther back here, I do find is uh, much better for applying the paint. Definitely felt a little bit too tight holding the brush that closely for this. But if you want it to be exact, you, you can hold it closer. Again, personal preference is a big part of it. And it's okay to paint the way that you want to paint. These videos are really just meant to encourage you, give you ideas, show you different opportunities, not to tell you exactly what to do. Because that's up to you. And that's how we interject ourselves into these creative processes. I know that it's a, a lesson I'm taking you through the steps, but you're the one making the painting. That impressive piece of artwork that you have at the end of this, that's yours. So it's because of you, that's because of your decisions and your hard work and I want you to feel like you have some real agency in it. Because you do. One of those things where I can just do this for hours. I love it. That said, I want clouds up here, small ones, in this palette. I've already drawn them on very lightly with Conte, spelled C-O-N-T-E. It's essentially a colored chalk. And I like to use it to draw on canvas that's already been painted like this because it comes off with just a little bit of water if you don't press too hard initially and it allows you to allocate different colors to different subjects so a great medium for this sort of thing that said here I'm just creating these small clouds which are just going to create some nice leading lines. You can see that I'm essentially saying, okay, there's a circle in the middle, and then I move as if there's a piece of string out in all of these directions, and that determines the line in which I paint. I really like it when I start to run out of paint get this incredibly soft look. Very natural. And then I also blend the edges out when I can, just make them a bit softer. There we go. Looking a little bit busy right now, but that's okay. We are going to work on that. Put that brush down. Pick up our previous filbert. And using this pigment, I'm going to create a cloud like this. I have it pre-drawn to a point. Again, leading lines pointing inwards softening the edges a little bit using the rounded edges of this brush. And then I'll bring it upwards. Need something a little bit darker for the back of it that isn't close to the light. So I'll grab a hint of ultramarine blue and Mars black. Work that in. Don't want too much paint on my brush, so I'll take off the excess elsewhere.
applying this predominantly to the areas that I know won't have light. Again, doing a, a blend with the edge of the brush that's softer, more rounded. Just like that. Very natural looking. Next, we'll do another one right up here, again looking for my drawing. I'm going to try to make these fairly soft initially. If I like them a lot then I can elaborate, but I'm applying almost no pressure with my brush. I'm softening the edges, letting it dissipate into the sky. Doing a a large blend towards the top and a softer, less dramatic blend on the bottom. So there is a blend, there isn't a sharp edge, but the top dissipates over a larger space than the bottom. We can get a little bit of the darker pigment again, taking off the excess. There we go. Different types of clouds are going to make it look much more natural. And it will look a lot better once we have the sun in there. And we do some other little touch-ups, just trust the process. Next, up here, very big area. So, we'll stick with this brush rather than going back to the liner. Going to cover the area that comes down first. There we go. This will, of course, do a blend upwards into the more purpley pigment, which I do not have enough of. So Mars Black, Ultramarine Blue, mix that with the previous color. This can be a little bit darker than what we have over here because it's towards the top. It's closer to us, it can have a greater contrast, it's farther away from the light. And we have more surface area, so opportunity and room to blend it into this, which will lighten it. I don't think I'm going to make this one hyper detailed or dramatic. It's towards the top of the canvas, so I don't want to kind of peel the eyes away from the, the center and everything that we have going on. So I'll probably make this area a bit more loose, free, less sharp or detailed. I ended up making it look a little bit more flat than I wanted by taking that contrasting top and blending it down dramatically. So something I can work back in slowly over time is slightly more of that contrast. But I don't want to do much. And I'm trying to do it while it's wet into wet just so I get a really soft look. So it isn't dramatic. There we go. It's very reflective because of the water and the paint, but as it dries I think it'll really fit well with everything else that we have going on here. Really like where this is going. Just making this a bit more cohesive with what we have there. 
making the edges a bit softer using this brush and those more rounded corners. So we're going to go from this more soft edge that's flowy towards the more rigid edges that we have down here because down there you just won't be able to see the detail in the same way, right? There we go. Now we are finally going to head back to the sun and we're going to do so with our filbert brush. However, it's worth noting for this step, I do heavily recommend really cleaning your brush well and getting fresh water for this next application. We're going to be working with our yellows and we just worked with blacks, uh, ultramarine blue, pigments that will dilute the yellow to a great degree. So make sure everything is clean, make sure everything is dry, and then we head back to our palette. I'll grab some of our primary yellow, grabbing from the undiluted areas within the pigment there. Grab a hint of our red and an abundance of titanium white. Just like that. For this, we're going to head in and work around our clouds. Now this is not necessarily the most easy application. Typically, we like to work our layers on top of one another, so the things that are farthest away are painted first, and then we slowly layer up. However, this was done out of order because building up this yellow in the wet orange paint is very difficult. And it's one of those things where we really needed to let it dry fully, but I also wanted to see how much detail we ended up creating in the clouds. So we're working in a slightly less effective way so that we can work with more information. You can see that I'm making these strokes, but barely anything is happening. That's because I have very little pigment on the end of my brush. My brush is damp and I'm using next to no pressure as well. All very intentional. We're going to head underneath. Do a little bit more of this. Blend it out to the left and right. Blend it as it works its way down. If you cover up portions of your smaller clouds, it's okay. We can always go back and repaint them in. Here we're just working that shine upwards and really letting it dissipate. Maybe a little finger painting. Next, we go for even more of a white mixture. And where do we apply that? Right where we did the first time in the middle, just like so. And then we blend that out. You can see it's soft, it's not that abundant. Lots of focus. And we can really build this up dramatically if we so choose, or we can let it continue to be a bit more subtle. Something I typically like to do to kind of discern how to move forward is I do a little bit, and then I work on something else. And while I work on that other thing, I think about, oh, you know, maybe Maybe I go back, maybe I do a little bit more, maybe maybe it's already enough. I, I really like to consider it over time while I work on other things, and I find that often gives me the 
decision that makes me the most satisfied at the end of the painting process. And I think that's how I'd like to proceed from here. So I'm just doing a little bit more yellow. And then I think we'll take a break from that spot. Now we're going to wander even farther down in the canvas and we'll actually start on our sand rather than the water because we want to layer the water on top of the sand and maybe even have some semi-transparent areas where the sand is showing underneath. So I'm going back to the one inch flat headed brush because it can pick up the most amount of paint and we have a lot of surface area here to cover. I'm going to start with our magenta We'll go in with an equal amount or slightly more of our yellow to render a nice saturated orange. Then we'll start desaturating it. So a combination of Mars black and titanium white, we do want to darken it fairly significantly. So we'll probably use an equal amount of Mars black and titanium white. As we talked about earlier, that will render something that's a bit more dark than mid-valued. I'm gonna test it on my reference photo really quick. And I think I want it to be a little bit more red. So we'll just work that in, do another little test, desaturate it. Friendly reminder to not go with the first color you mix if you don't love it, especially when working on such a large area. I'm going to do another test. It's close, slightly brighter, not much. I'm not going to use an abundance of paint. We can slowly add it back in. And I think this is it. That's perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by working my way around the edges because again, that's when we have the best ability to render sharp lines. And then we apply more pressure with our brush and we just fill in the negative space. That said, you can tell because the brush is damp just how thin all of this really is. You can see the red and some of the other pigments kind of bleeding into the edges. So we can go in with either a mixture that has less water or we can apply this, let it dry, and then go back in with a second layer. And that's what I'm going to do. Just so we have the opportunity to remix, maybe adjust the color to be a little bit better. It's always an opportunity with layer two. And just build up those good habits, right? Also, if we took off, or rather didn't use much water, there's still a fair chance we'd have to go back in with um, a second layer anyway. That said, I'm going to grab a little bit of Mars Black, make a darker variant of it. You can see I'm still leaving half of my mix, that initial color, so I can remix to it a little bit later. But I do want the left-hand side to be darker. And I'll do a soft blend inwards. But I essentially want this to be darker because it's farther away from the light. It's less wet, so it'll be less reflective. And it'll create a nice vignette. So three good reasons why the edging and maybe even the bottom a little bit here can be darker, leaving this area brighter very specifically right there. That said, we can only add so much paint without ripping it off while it's wet, so I'm going to let this dry, come back, and we'll finish it up in layer number two. As an update, it's been a little while. This is now fully dry to the touch, so I'll grab my brush, make sure that it's nice and damp. We'll go back in, create a very similar mixture. Might make this one slightly brighter than the last, but not dramatically so. And there you can see, turning into a bit of a green because I had about an equal mixture, I would say, of red and yellow, rather than making it slightly red dominant. So we'll just find something akin to what we had. Could use slightly more orange. 
again opting for something a little bit brighter. This is going to look darker because it's it doesn't have the white of the canvas showing through but the mix itself is in fact brighter by quite a bit. Nice and thick. Remember the edge needs to be darker, minorly. So we'll just work that in. Wet into wet. Very easy process on the second layer. Just like so. Now, again, wanting to brighten this up, minorly. A little bit more titanium white in the mix. Yellow, red. Get that slightly orange hue. We of course won't get what we actually have on the palette. Rather a mix. There we go. Really like that. I think that's a, a great pigment for the sand, at least the first iteration of it. We can brighten it up later if we want, but I don't want it to become too distracting or take our attention away from the water or the horizon. So for now, we'll keep it. Now for the water, we're going to stick with the one inch flat headed and we're going to start with a very dark base layer which will build highlights and reflections on top of. So for this, we'll grab some Mars Black, our ultramarine blue, probably about an equal amount. We'll grab half that in our red, give it a bit of warmth, slightly more purple, and a hint of titanium white to render a bit more of a gray, but something that will also allow us to see little bits of hue in there as well. Because if it's too dark, we can't really see that, right? Now, I'm going to start applying this, and you know what, I'll test it on my reference photo. It looks good on the photo. It looks quite dark on the canvas. I may brighten it up. I'm going to. This is one of those times where we take those artistic liberties, and that's okay. This is our darker value. That's much better, in my opinion. I like that so much more. It's not dramatically different. Maybe if I turn up the brightness on the camera, you can see a little bit, maybe not. <laughs> It, it does look slightly more blue. And you know what? I might make it even brighter just so you can see. I don't think it will hinder the actual painting at all. Be fairly careful around the edges, though we will do a lot of work on them specifically. You know, this is actually working out well. The back, a little bit darker. The front, a little bit lighter. I like that. This, however, is a little bit thin. So much like the sand, we will have to do two layers. And much like the sand, our second layer will probably be a little bit more aesthetic. So, not a bad thing. I'll just finish up the horizon line and I'll show you how I get a nice straight line through that. I like to take my pinky finger, ground it on something. I'm going to use the easel. And then rather than making a singular line, I'm going to make a series of horizontal strokes. Stroke, one, two, three, four, five, six. Just counting so you can get an idea of when the start and stop occurs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Making a little micro adjustments. Nine, 10, 11. Trying to get something fairly straight. You can also use a painter's tape if you find that more convenient. But 
I like to do it in multiple strokes rather than a singular elongated one because typically when we go for that elongated stroke, we include an arch, a curve, whether it be from our wrist or our elbow, maybe even the shoulder. It tends to not be straight, but rather one way or the other like that. So instead, I just make a series of strokes that add up and build to a singular line. There we go. Again, I'm going to need a second layer. I'll probably do that without recording it simply because we're just painting a uh, base. And then from there, we can start working on some of the details and fun stuff together. So we pulled the camera a little bit farther back and layer two is fully dry to the touch. So we can proceed with starting to separate different waves. Now we're going to do so with the one inch flat headed brush because we still have to cover large areas of surface, but we're going to go in with somewhat of a highlight, but not our true highlight, kind of a, a mid value. Now it will be a bit of an orange. So we'll start with the typical half and half of our primary yellow and our magenta. Go in with some titanium white to thicken it up, desaturate it, and Mars black to darken it and further desaturate it. It isn't turning into a green, which is good. I'm gonna do a little test on my reference photo, and I actually really like that as our first pigment. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave darker areas as essentially dividing spots for our waves. The areas that are kind of overlapping the water that's coming up. So here, you can see I'm leaving this darker area and that's going to be for a wave, just like so. Then we'll have another one right under it to the right. And we'll have another as we move towards the foreground. Just looking at the reference photo, doing this somewhat roughly so that it ends up being nice and natural. But again, you are more than welcome to use the traceable or the reference photo or both. Whatever makes it a comfortable experience for you. I'd also just like to take a minute here to say a big, big thank you to everybody who is up over on Patreon supporting the channel. Hope that you are finding the trace boards and all of that very useful. Without you, these lessons would not and could not happen. Say it in every video, but I feel like it's something that should be said in every video because you just make such a, a big difference in my life and therefore in the, the life of this channel and the fact that these lessons get made. So. Again, <laughs> just a, a big sincere thank you for doing what you do. Also, for those of you who may be new to the channel and unaware, maybe this is your first video. If so, congrats on making it so far. Always really respect when people are willing to put this much time into learning painting. I know that these aren't short videos in a, a world of YouTube where you can watch, you know, all of these three to four minute speed paintings. Good for you for putting the time in and really trying to learn as much as you can, despite the length. That said, if you are new to the channel, 
and you are interested in supporting it or getting things like the traceables up over on Patreon, you can also get access to all five of my ebooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, which is essentially the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic painting before you jump into your first acrylic painting. In it. in it, we talk about what brushes to use, how to blend with water, composition, different color combinations. Really, again, it's the foundation of what you need to know. There are also a bunch of ebooks full of just different traceables for those uninspired days where you know you want to create something, you want to practice, but you're not sure what you want to make. You can also get access to our exclusive Facebook group where everybody shares their renditions of these lessons. It's a very supportive, incredibly positive community and group, which I am always quite proud of. Just the, the general demeanor of the people in there. If you are there, big thank you for <laughs> being a part of that. But you can also get access to that group. Just going to look under the sun and apply a second layer of this light highlight very specifically there because that's where it's going to really reflect that light. There we go. Doesn't look like water yet, but fear not, it will. <laughs> just, uh, it's just gonna take a minute. With that, I'm going to take this brush, put it down, get you a little bit closer for some detail work. Now, we'll be switching over to the Filbert brush yet again, and we'll create a brighter mixture of what we were just working with. So a little bit of titanium white that will really desaturate it. So follow it up with some yellow and red not going to throw the Mars black in, and I'm going to do a little test on the reference photo. It looks good. I'm going to go under the sun because that's where the real light is. And then I'll make a series of horizontal strokes with some separation towards the back, but not too much separation because realistically, we're not going to see that much detail in the water this far away. We're not going to see all of the separation in the waves. We're just going to see the larger movements and the more dramatic changes in value. Now, I'll take that pigment off my brush, grab a little bit more, continue to inch forward in the painting, and as I do, I'll create more separations in my horizontal strokes. We'll still let it dissipate as it moves from left to right. And now here, as we get fairly close to us, we're going to leave much larger openings. The initial air is still wet. So we're getting a real wet into wet blend here, which gives us a nice soft application, but means that this won't stand out as well as it could without additional layers and that's okay. There we go. Slowly building it up. And then it'll be much more noticeable up here in the foreground. So leaving space, pressing very lightly. I have an abundance of paint on my brush. Creating this pattern, which will dissipate as you move out towards the edges. Just like so. And we can even switch to the liner brush, which will make damp. Grab some of that pigment.
and create these applications. Still have quite a bit left to do in the water though. There we go. Now, we're going to move a little bit farther back. I'm just going to adjust the viewfinder, the camera, just a hint. And we're going to reapply some highlights in there. If you wait for it to dry, these will go on much easier. We'll grab some of our yellow, our red, titanium white. Again, we're going for something brighter, but also slightly more saturated. And typically we don't mix with this brush, but we're not really making much paint. It's not a grand mixture. So it's not really troublesome with this brush. Again, we have general rules and we have times where we break them. That's okay. So light pinky finger to ground hand, horizontal strokes that avoid the darker waves that separate our water. And I don't know if we have explained it yet, but the separation in the waves is darker because the water is going down and the waves are opposite to the sun. So the sun is coming, but it can't hit that wall. It's essentially a wall on the opposite side of the sun. And it's quite dense because it's a mass amount of water. So you just don't end up seeing light move through it. And it looks a lot darker. It looks like shelves, essentially. Organic shelves, shelves that have bends and turns, but shelves nonetheless. You can see that I'm really building these up. And if you're wondering why I'm painting all of this detail with this small brush and you are so far away, it's because we're adding subtle applications that can dramatically change how this all works together. And it's one of those subjects where while it's detail oriented, if you paint it from a distance and you are very mindful of it from a distance, it'll probably end up a whole lot better. So I am trying to paint from a bit of a distance. And I want you to look at it from a bit of a distance so you can see the larger patterns and ideas, but also so when you go to paint your own, you think of painting a little bit farther back, but also taking breaks, taking five or six steps back, looking at it. Another good trick is to put a mirror up behind your canvas, and then you can look at the mirror and the painting will look significantly farther away. So you don't actually have to take all of those steps back. You can also paint by looking in a mirror. It's a little bit tricky, but it gives you a, an opportunity to create a really accurate piece. It's a technique used semi-commonly in portraiture, as that's something that needs to be quite exact. Whenever I go in to do this, I line my brush up with the sun. Just make sure that I'm on the right path in general. Try to let it dissipate as you move towards the left and right. And we can even wrap some of these highlights down around the shadow area. Try to pull from pre-existing ones. Be 
careful not to overdo it. But it can be a nice effect. We're also going to take a fairly watery mixture, head down here, and add a little bit of a shine to the sand. Doing a wet into dry blend. Brush is essentially just water at this point. Moving the paint around. And some finger painting for the smooth blend. Now, let's get you a little bit closer yet again. Now, the highlights, as previously noted, are typically better when they are done from an afar, but I showed you that. We covered that lesson, you understand it. So, now, for teaching sake, we'll do this a bit closer up. But I'm starting by just mixing a new, slightly brighter variant, slightly more saturated variant, of what I was previously working with. There we go. That's a very nice rich orange. Definitely the most vibrant that we've used yet. Fairly yellow. So I'm going to use this in the background. And there's, again, little separation between the strokes when we are far back and it gets larger as you move towards us in the foreground. I'm also trying to get rid of that hard dark line that I have on the horizon. We can have it on the left and the right, but right under the sun, I don't think so. Okay, I think that's probably enough of the fairly yellow mixture. Let's grab a little bit more of our red, work that in. Find the center. And I'm trying predominantly to work over previously applied spots and build them up because now we'll be working light onto light rather than light onto dark. Grab a bit more. And you can see how it just slowly builds up layer by layer until we get something beautiful. You can even go in with smaller markings than what I'm making. It'll take longer, but you can get a lot of realism that way. And I'm going for a bit more of a painterly look in the water this time. We do have some lessons on the channel that are very realism based. Sometimes I want a painting to look a bit more like a painting to capture the feeling. You know, I feel like this is just one of those times. You have a lot of elements of realism, so I feel like we can do a little bit of a balance. There we go, making that sand look nice and wet. Have that beautiful glow coming in on it. Just continuously building these things up. And 
things we do. Got a little too loose with those strokes. Going to need to clean them. Find the edges, make them sharp again. Something else I'd like to do is grab some Mars black, a little bit of our blue, our magenta, hint of our titanium white, not too much. And in the same way that we had these little areas kind of come down with the light, I'm going to create darker markings that do the same. So they're going to work from the side and then they're going to do a slight little curve down. And it's just going to give us a little bit of extra depth. So here's an example. Horizontal, curve down. Horizontal, curve down. Horizontal, curve down. We don't need to do hundreds of them, but they can help us separate areas that might have become a little too visually stagnant, a little too repetitive. Just add some extra easy dimension to it. You can also separate areas to create additional waves should you want to. And we can use it to just break up larger block areas. See? This is something that works predominantly in the foreground because we just won't see that detail in the distance. Now, it's also worth noting that we really want the waves to essentially get smaller as you move into the background because perspective is just going to make them look smaller. So, something I'm going to do is go in for a bit more of a mid-orange. Something almost akin to what we used for the first application and layer of it. Just remixing to essentially what we have on the edge there using the liner brush so it's taking a little bit more time but that's okay and I think that looks quite good. I'm going to make sure the brush is nice and damp, doesn't have an abundance of paint on it and I'll go back to the background and just thin some of those waves and I'll also take this pigment and I'll work it into other portions. That way it's nice and cohesive in case it's a little bit different from what we had. There we go. You see how we're just making them smaller and then incorporating that color elsewhere? I think that's working quite nicely. Breaking them up too a little bit. We also don't need a hyper heavy vignette. The water is giving us a nice one because we have the majority of the light in the center, but it doesn't have to be almost black. So I'll use this opportunity to just brighten it up a little bit. Always lots of fun in the touch-up stage. There we go. Can also create much more of a highlight, something akin to what we had in the water previously, 
So a lot of titanium white, a lot of our red, yellow, create something not quite on the level of the sun. We can add that right under it. So there's almost a, a blend from one to the other. And then sparingly, we can throw it underneath. And almost create a, a line of light. This is quite subtle. You can definitely make it more dramatic if you so choose. There we go. I think we just need to apply it slightly more this way. It's quite heavily favored to the right. Let's have it dissipate to the left as well. There we are. It's looking quite nice. Finishing strong. And I think we almost have the light in there. With that, I would like to say a big, big thank you to you for being here, sticking in for this lesson. Again, I know that these aren't the quickest painting lessons, but I do try to make them thorough and I do try to ensure that you're not only learning how to do this painting, but also other paintings as well. If you've enjoyed yourself, I do recommend subscribing and hitting the little bell button down below that'll notify you when new videos go up on the channel so you have a, a brand new painting to work on. Also, I always like to do a little keyword towards the end of these videos that you can use in the comments either as just an individual word or you can incorporate it into a sentence but it essentially is a code word that lets me know that you got to the end of the video lets everybody else you got to the end know that you are also one of the generally 13 percent who made it to the end it's a little badge of honor i think always need to see who does make it towards the end but we're working on some shimmering water here. I think shimmering is a, a good, neat word. It's one we haven't used before, so you can just type that in the comments or you can incorporate it into a sentence. Doesn't even have to be about this painting. Could be, you know, about a, a scene you've seen in real life or really whatever pops into your head. Also, Again, major thank you to everybody who is up over on Patreon who made this lesson happen here today. Incredibly grateful to you. Everybody else who might be new and considering it, again, there's a link in the video description. We can get the traceables, the reference photos, the ebooks, the access to our exclusive Facebook group. A lot of fun stuff up there. It's also just a great way of supporting the channel, which is predominantly community funded by great people like yourself. So thank you for the support. Thank you for being here. I hope you love what you ended up creating. And I already know what I'm doing for the next video. So again, make sure you subscribe because that should be coming out fairly soon. And I'm really looking forward to showing you what's next. So thank you for being here. And above all, as always, stay creative.